Good afternoon. Yeah, today I'd like to thank everybody for being on time and those that were early. I like to see early people sign in. <clears throat> My name is Cotillion and I'm with the University of Arizona's Cooperative Extension Program and I'm one of the literacy specialists. So you'll be hearing a lot from myself and Chris, who is also a literacy specialist with um, the Goa Tiwa <clears throat> Teachable Moments for Apache Children. So again, thank you for being here. Just kind of some announcements. Uh, we are recording the session and it will be available on the website. For some reason <clears throat> you get kicked out or you just view it at a later time, it will be available. Chris is gonna go ahead and tell you about our programs and about the materials that are available on our website. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Christine Carlson. As Cotillion said, I work for the San Carlos um, branch of the Goa Teachable Moments for Apache Children out of the Gila County Cooperative Extension Program. Um, we've got many brackets grants that's available to both parents, teachers, and children. And so I wanted to just take a moment to talk a little bit about our many options that are available through our program. Um, as Cotillion said, our program is called CIFAR Early Literacy Program that is a federal grant that we've been able to have the opportunity to share in two regions of the state. I work in the Carlos program and Cotillion works in the Sanders Navajo Nation area. Um, we've got the two divisions, College for the Navajo Nation and Gua Teachable Moments for Apache Children in San Carlos. The program started during the heart of COVID, and so we did some alterations in our programming and started a lot with our virtual opportunities. We took the chance to create some handouts and video, quick tip videos that go along with this. We each also created many book sharing story time videos. These materials can be found on our website that we'll talk about here in just a moment, as well as on our Facebook and YouTube pages. We're finding much success with both of those areas and that parents are being able to learn multiple strategies and ideas for read, write, talk, play, and sing through everyday routines and using everyday materials. That's one of the greatest things about this program is that we're not asking families and providers to come up with materials that they are gonna need. Everything can be found around the house and, and, and just incorporating everything into their daily work of what they're already doing with their children. And many times the really fun part is as we're working on activities, ask parents how else they can use the ideas and they're already spewing ideas that they use, something that they've already done, and so really being a collaborative opportunity for everyone to be able to. As I shared, these are some of the examples of our handouts and our videos. Each handout has an accompanying video, so it gives you a quick minute or a minute and a half idea as to how to use the items on the handouts. Each handout, there's approximately 12 handouts. This example is talking about listening to podcasts in order to be able to come up with another means of audio use for reading instead of having um, the child in looking for other means of being able to get away from that screen opportunities for children to be exposed to many different learning opportunities and hearing stories hearing different languages singing songs many opportunities to interact with young children cotillion i think we might have lost chris do you want to take us through the rest of these slides yeah some things that are also available through our programs are multiple parent and teach communities so we do drop-in literacy events, um, which has been virtual right now, uh, but we hope everything is safe. We'll go back to having them in the communities where <clears throat> it's a quick drop-in literacy event. It can be anything from sharing stories, uh, story stones, um, rhyme, making rhyming boxes. And, and also we're doing a parent multi-session series, which uh, consists of um, six sessions working with pre, pre k age children, which is three to five. And um, right now that's also given our, our health and safety guidelines that are in place. <clears throat> we also do care providers and teachers multi-session series. And we do work closely, as you have noticed, um, when you registered for this event, we asked for your <clears throat> Arizona Early Childhood Workforce Registry number and that's available to Arizona early childhood workers. <clears throat> and I'm not sure uh, living in New Mexico, if New Mexico has something similar to that, I'm still trying to figure that out. But uh, on this 
uh, PowerPoint, you can see some examples of what those um, activities look like. So we do have some litter lids there that you can see that are just made with things from home, from your milk cartons, from your water bottles. So these are things that you just tend to, to throw out, right? The multi-session series focuses on reading, writing, talking, playing, singing. <clears throat> we provide all the materials if there's any provided that includes books. Uh, sessions include story picture walks, um, of course, stories, activities. This happens with the parent and child. We do pattern reading and singing. Uh, we do a name game puzzle and um, environmental reading. That's really reading anything in the environment the child is in. Um, there are opportunities for professional development. Uh, last year, we did a, um, a parent development on culturally relevant teaching, and we, we had a uh, quite a turnout for that. This time, we chose to focus on <clears throat> the uh, literacy and, and book event. So what we did is we, we, did, we, well, actually, one of the advisory board members for San Carlos, her name is Latoya Beatty, came up with this um, idea that we should, you know, focus on a book event. So as a team, <clears throat> we decided to call this dipping into local indigenous wealth. So when you look in your communities, you already have a wealth of resources and people that are knowledgeable about oral stories, oral history, family stories, family history. So we decided to um, invite a local children's book author, Daniel Vandiver, and also from San Carlos, a traditional oral storyteller, storyteller, Ken Duncan. And so we wanted to kind of localize this professional development so that it's more relevant to the families you're working with. Um, you kind of see some similarities, but also you're going to see some differences. But we hope and, and we, we tried to think through this as to what will really help you in the classrooms and working with families and working with parents and working with children. So also this is tied to the Arizona Early Childhood Workforce Registry. So some of the <clears throat> contact informations are here. We have my information on there, the website, um, our emails, our phone numbers. We are on Facebook. Um, so here are all of, all of the uh, websites and links that you um, can go to. All of the things we mentioned, the quick tip videos, the story time videos, those are all on here. You're welcome to use them. It's open to everybody. Uh, when we plan the um, drop-in events, they're also listed on there and what the titles are going to be, what the topic is going to be. So in your free time, whenever that is, as educators, take a look at it. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there that's really localized, is down to earth, and is, is really real. And so that was something we were shooting for. All right. So... Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned before, one of the advisory board members had talked about how using um, um, Native authors and Native resource to, to kind of um, to tell families how important it is that children see themselves represented in their books that they're reading and books that are available in their classroom, uh, books that we are buying and putting inside our homes that cultural relevance is important to children because then they are able to see themselves and some of the things that they're used to represented in those books. And, and that's a big part of their, their whole development. Um, you know, when they're looking at these books and they can familiarize themselves with, oh, I know what that is, or we, we do this sometimes here at home, that really helps them build a connection to the books and build a connection to reading in general. Kind of the events for today is we're going to listen to Daniel um, present about his books and you know kind of give us a background story about that. We'll also hear from Ken and we'll take a short break and then we'll go ahead and go into our breakout rooms. You did have a little bit of homework for this event. We asked you to um, bring a title, probably the author and a, a description of the book you will be sharing. We prefer children's books um, written by Native American authors. Um, that's what we're trying to focus on. So I'll go ahead and introduce our first presenter, 
So the first person I'd like to introduce is Daniel Vandiver. He does have his email uh, information on there. He is from Haystack, New Mexico, and that's around, if you're familiar with New Mexico, it is um, north of Pruitt, and I would say maybe east of the Rue. Um, so he's from that area. He's the grandson of the late Joe Vandiver Sr., who was a Navajo co-talker, um, United States Marines, and he's the grandson of Bessie D. Vandiver. He is Danette and is a product of Small Wonders Daycare, where his experience as a Ninja Turtle helped shape the creativity behind his debut picture book, Fallen Line Holden. It is a 2017 American Indian Youth Literature Award honor book, and he's also the owner of um, South of Sunrise Creative, a strategic communications firm that helps advance education initiatives through community-based strategies. He also has a new book, Horizon. Um, that's his second book, and is, that's the book he's going to share during this reading. And that is actually his first book published by South of Sunrise um, Creative. So his recent book is a 2022 American Indian Youth Literature Award Honor book, and we're happy to have him. Um, you know, we're just we're, we want to congratulate you from the U of A Extension um, Program, Daniel. And I'll hand it over to Chris to introduce. You. We are excited to also have with us today Ken Duncan Sr. He is an accomplished cultural flute teacher and flute player, artist, and storyteller. Today we have having him share a story with us and a, a cooperative activity to be able to engage your students in the classroom while participating in that activity. He is the graduate of the Institute of American Indians Art. He is the founder and director of the renowned family business, Yellowbird Productions. They present across the nation, across the world on, on their practices and for, um, presentations of their dance and songs and music. If you have the opportunity to ever see them, it's a um, wonderful opportunity. He was named the Cultural Keeper of Arizona by Arizona's Governor Office in 2004 and was recognized with the Arizona Native American Business of the Year Award in 2015. And he is a resound pre presenter around the world, again, in being able to provide opportunities for learning with others in speaking presentations, in published works, and as an accomplished storyteller. So we welcome and thank both of our presenters for being with us today. And Daniel, welcome, and please, um, I turn this over to you for your fabulous story event. Well, thank you for having me today. I'd like to uh, extend my gratitude to U of A uh, Cooperative Services and everyone who joined in on the call. Um, I think that what is happening here is where change happens and where growth happens. And so I'm really honored to be invited to uh, talk about my books and um, get into the reasons of why they were created. As was mentioned, I'm the author of two books. My first book, Fall in Line Holden, received the, uh, the Honor Award through the American Indian uh, Library Association in 2018, I believe it was. I kind of slipped up on that, but uh, it won the award for Honor Book at that time. And then most recently, I published Horizon, which was awarded the 2022 American Indian Youth Literature Award Best Picture Book too. So um, in creating these books, I think what really drove it was my own experiences growing up and recognizing a need for diverse voices and representation in early childhood literature. Um, and so I wanna be able to talk about each with you all today, get into a lot of the foundations of why and how they were created, and then um, you know, make myself available for any questions that the group might have. Uh, I will be monitoring the chat. So if you do have any um, questions or wanna be able to share some input, um, I'll, I'll be able to get into it from, from there. But um, that's what I'll be talking about here today. A little introduction about myself. I know that we were saying um, from Haystack, New Mexico, uh, if you haven't been there or seen it, if you've ever passed along Route 66 heading towards Albuquerque, uh, right before you get to Grants is where you would find Haystack. It's called Zithlachi in Navajo, which means Red Mountain. And so if you ever see this big old red mesa off to the side, uh, that's where I'm from. I'm coming to you today from Tucson, uh, but this is the community that I call home. Uh, 
introducing myself traditionally, I think that's important just to establish relations and to give some insight into who I am and where I come from. Irish and Schley, Kyoani Bushish Chin, Irish Dasha Chair, and Tachini Dashanella. Zotzetl de Masha, or Zitlachi de Shokuan. I got Ego de Nenschle. And so, in introducing myself, as I mentioned, it's a good way to provide some insight into my life. My first clan is that I'm Irish. And if you look off to the left, you'll see a picture of a little chubby cheeked little Daniel as a kid uh, with my mom. She's Irish. I always joke when I'm reading to kids that I'm the luckiest Navajo you'll ever meet because I'm Irish. So if you rub my head, you might get an A on your test or you will get that type of luck. Uh, my second clan is um, Kia'ani or Towering House clan, which comes from my father by way of his mom, which you'll see my grandmother off to the right. Her name was Bessie D. Vandiver. Um, Kia'ani clans, you know, traditionally for the Navajo were, were the educators uh, within the band. And so I used to always joke and say I used to hate growing up in the educator's household. My mom was a special education teacher. My uncle was a principal. My sister's a math teacher and now a principal. And I used to hate coming home and at dinner table be talking and hearing about all of their naughty kids or what happened that day or writing IEPs. Uh, but, you know, 20 years later, I ended up working in tribal higher education for Navajo Technical University. And I think that comes from my clan. My third clan is I'm also Irish by way of my mom's father. And then my fourth clan is I'm Tachini. Uh, by way of my dad's father, uh, who you'll see a picture of here off to the right right here. And Tachini traditionally were a lot of the warriors within uh, the Navajo, red running into the water. And so you'll see my grandfather here in his military gear. Uh, but that's how I'm a Navajo individual. You'll see a picture of my family at the bottom of the screen where my grandfather is sitting with my grandmother and my brother um, at a, within our family Hogan. And so my grandfather was also a medicine man, but uh, that's how I'd like to introduce myself. I always like to allude to my grandfather because to me, this is the inspiration to pretty much everything I do today. Uh, as I mentioned, he was a co-talker. Uh, he passed in 2019 or 2020 at the very beginning of the year in February. Uh, but for me, he was a, served as a source of inspiration, especially knowing and understanding what the co-talkers had done during World War II. See him here, him here as a young man, and then here in, uh, later in his life. Uh, but for me, he used to always value and stress the importance of your words. He used to say, you can either make somebody's day or break it with the words that come out of your mouth. So be very uh, tentative and uh, spend special care towards the word you say. And so for him, he's my inspiration. And I think without him, I don't think I would have pursued writing books or trying to get my message out there. So um, I, I like to acknowledge that. Um, and like I said, he's really the reason and the being and why I wrote books. And so what came out of that and when I first started publishing this book was this idea of Fallen Line Holden. Uh, and you'll see the picture here. I'd like to do a reading of it uh, as my introduction to really get you into uh, the book and why it was created, but then also speak to some of the literary devices in the uh, inspiration behind it, because I think that's what's going to really resonate with you all in figuring out how can it be used with uh, children. But the very first thing that it's about, and I do want to kind of put this out there, is that it does speak to boarding school era education. And if, you know, you're not familiar with it, um, I think it's a period of history which has resonated and impacted our communities uh, today. It's still having a lasting impact if you don't know boarding school era education, because it has many connotations to different people, uh, for Native Americans and indigenous people throughout the country, it was used as a tool to assimilate, to get rid of identity, to conform, to get the Indian out of the man. And so you'll see a lot of the pictures and impact of what that was. And I used to always hear stories from my dad growing up of what that was. And unfortunately, it wasn't always in good settings or context. Oftentimes, it was in a story filled with tears and reflection of what was he had to go through. He used to tell stories of first getting to school, and the very first thing that happened was everybody got a haircut. So if you were a female, you had the bangs chopped across the side, uh, top, down to the side, and then all the way around, so it kind of looked like you had a mushroom on your head or a helmet. You might see one of the uh, little girls here with that uh, haircut displayed. If you were a male, he used to talk about getting his entire head shaved except for his bangs. 
So if he got in trouble, he'd get pulled by it. Get over here, Obi. Don't be doing that. And to me, it had a lasting impact. You know, as a fourth grader, he ran away from Fort Wingate boarding school, um, from Fort Wingate to Haystack with his two cousins. And you imagine that 45 mile trek, how bad must it have been for these individuals to run away? Um, of course, he got caught right when he got home and he got shipped off to Crown Point boarding school after that happened. But to me, a lot of the pain came up from that. So for me, my per intent and purpose of writing this book was to raise awareness about this period, to provide space for a grandparent or a parent to read to a child and express uh, what this meant to them and what, 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 it, what its impact has been. I also wrote the book uh, to be able to address early literacy. As I mentioned, I worked for Navajo Technical University for 10 years and um, data showed that about two out of every three students that came in there required some form of developmental education in math, English, writing, and language. And so uh, for me, I figured it might be a little too late oftentimes to address that problem uh, by the time it was college level. So I wanted to write this book to be able to combat uh, literacy at an early age. And so within this book, I'd like you guys to each pay attention to a lot of the techniques I implemented in the book in order to be addressed and to really think about these things if you're to be reading it with the child in order to help with literacy. So I use techniques such as comments, predicting events, and asking questions. I dive into things like the characters and what's going to happen uh, with the events. Uh, things like word anticipation and cadence and repetition and language development. So throughout the book, Pay a little bit of attention to each of these and see if you could spot these. And since this is my introduction, I'm not going to be asking so much questions with you all, uh, which I'll do with my second book, but keep that in mind. And I will read it as if I were to be reading to a, a, a class or a child. So the first thing you mentioned, uh, I mentioned the storyline and characters and settings. Pay attention to where this book takes place, who the characters are, and how that story progresses. So painting the frame of where we are such as a boarding school, how does that uh, depicted not only in the words and the uh, story, but in the visual representations as well. I mentioned the use of repetition. So one of the things you'll notice as we read this book is there's a repetition of the phrase, we all fall in line. This was done with the intent and purpose to be able to have kids catch on as it's happening. So if you're a first time reader and you're not really picking up the words, if you know the uh, flow of the story, you could be able to you know, join in whenever this line is read. And then cadence and rhyme. To elicit the marching of the hallways and going through the boarding school, and kind of bringing out the tone of the militant tone of the story, uh, it was written in cadence and rhyme. So as you see uh, you know, the text, again, this is uh, meant to be embedded into readers' minds. So if they're able to pick up on it, they can then follow up and participate and then uh, develop their literacy from there. So if you hear, we move slowly in silence with no words of defiance, we all fall in line. So keep those things in mind because each of them were developed uh, with intention of improving literacy. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into Fall in Line Holden. I always tell kids before we begin that this book isn't titled Fall in Line Holden. What it's really called is Fall in line, Holden, as if you're a teacher or a parent or an older sibling who's kind of getting uh, mad at you and is kind of telling you to fall in line. So if I were to be reading with the kids, we'd all say this collectively as the page pops up. Fall in line, Holden. So without further ado, Fall in line, Holden, written and illustrated by Daniel W. Vandermeer. Deep in the heart, of indigenous nation stood a strict Western school of stern education where everyone obeyed and did what they were told and conformity ruled all to fit like a mold until a boy fell out of line. Who do you think that boy is? As class ends and recess begins, we all fall in line. We pass through the halls with art covered walls. We all fall in line. Can you tell what classroom we're passing here? Art. 
And what animals do we see? Can we say them together? Lion, zebra, giraffe, right? Okay, I'm gonna put you to test. Let's try it. Fall in line, Holden. And what animals do you see? You see the lion, zebra, and giraffe. If you'll notice, whereas all of Holden's classmates were just passing by, missing the beauty of the art up on the wall, when Holden was passing by, the art came to life and here they are popping out at him. So you'll see his imagination come to life. We march left and then right with no end in our sight. We all fall in line. We bypass the laughs of the custodial staff. We all fall in line. Who are these guys? Janitors, right? Fall in line, Holden. What does Holden see? He doesn't see joking janitors. He sees rodeo clowns. Look at this silly guy. He even jumped into his trash bucket from the previous page. Must be a barrel racer around. We move slowly in silence with no words of defiance. We all fall in line. We pass the school's gym as a battle begins. We all fall in line. What are they playing here? Can you guys tell? Looks like they're playing dodgeball, right? But Holden's not going to see dodgeball. What do you think he's going to see? Let's find out. Fall in line, Holden. So rather than seeing a dodgeball battle, he's actually seen an ancient Roman battle come to life. I'm sure you see some of those dodgeballs in there, but here they are battling it out. Our tired minds lag and our heavy feet drag. We all fall in line. We pass the lunch crew to the smell of mutton stew. We all fall in line. Who here likes mutton? I do. And what are they passing? It's like the cafeteria, right? What do you think Holden's going to see? It's something different, right? It's not going to be cooks. Fall in line, Holden. So rather than seeing cooks with the stove, that little stove turned into a cauldron and the brew, a witch or the cafeteria staff passed around brooms and they're all flying around as witches. We do as we're told and don't dare to be bold. We all fall in line. In respectable fashion, we pass the lab's distractions. We all fall in line. Where they are here? Computer lab, right? Looks like they have the computers up here, maybe a little smart board up on the top. Wonder what Holden's gonna see. Fall in line, Holden. As you can see, all of those computer screens came together and it's a spaceship. We even got a couple of astronauts over here. Even this guy right here who's upside down. I wonder if he has a brain rush with all that blood going to his head, going upside down. And though our backs ache, our spirits never break, we all fall in line. Our class rambles on to the band's rhythmic song. We all fall in line. What do you think he's gonna see here? It's the music class. Maybe they'll... Uh, have a rock concert or marching band? Let's find out. Fall in line, Holden. Look, they got musical instruments and they fell out of their little uh, choir line. And all of those music notes turned into birds. Can we count together how many birds there are? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got eight birds. With the playground in sight and just the glimmer of light, we all fall in line. But as we reach the door, we can't take it anymore. And can you guys tell what's different? And here I'll ask the group, 
I'll take my one little break. Can you tell what's different from the story that we've been reading so far? Hey, we got our first uh, input. Somebody says color. Yes, if you notice throughout the entire book, the only person who was in color was Holden. He had a blue shirt on. We have somebody else saying no line. They're not in line anymore. They're all staggered. So it looks like they broke rank and are, are, are out of line. One more difference. There's movement. They're running. Yeah, there you go. They're running. They're no longer marching in cadence. It looks like they're just booking it for the door, ready to go to recess. And so you see those three differences. Good. But as we reach the door, we can't take it anymore. And we all fall out of line. And you could see that they finally made it to recess. And you see all of our friends from the entire journey. Who do we see? Looks like we see the witches. Do you recall what room that was from? The cafeteria. And here they are in color. We see the zebra poking his head out. Hopefully the lion isn't there ready to eat him. We see the music birds flying around. We see the clown. Remember the joking janitors? We also have the astronaut still floating upside down. Oh no, hopefully he turns up uh, right upside, right side up soon. And then we got Holden here. And you notice Holden doesn't even go outside. And that's really the purpose of the book right there. If you're like Holden and you're able to engage in things, perhaps your children and your kids in your classes in activities such as art, music, um, PE, you know, that's the space where a lot of learning happens and growing the imagination. Uh, that's what you really would like to hope to see with developing kids. Uh, but oftentimes when you're stuck in the classroom and you're forced to abide by things like standardized tests and, uh, you know, you see that the world's a lot less bright. Even the teacher over here I always say is miserable. And, uh, and so it's really important to be like Holden, to really grow your imagination, to promote individuality, and to uh, celebrate what makes us each unique. And I always say that to the kids is value who you are. If you're a boy with long hair, be proud of that because that makes you who you are. Um, if you wear, you know, different types of clothes that makes you unique, celebrate that. And so uh, that was my first book, Follow Mine Holden. Just trying to be cognizant of time. Uh, so hopefully within that book, you were able to see really the benefits of how I inserted different literacy, literacy techniques. Um, it was my intention to hopefully use that book, as I mentioned before, to speak about boarding school era education. Uh, I know that it's not really possible to use a children's books to talk about the horrors and atrocities like getting your hair shaved or pulled or getting spanked for speaking your language. Uh, but it was my intent that if you were to be reading this with the kid, those conversations could start to happen. And that space would allow for that history to be discussed uh, because I feel like a lot of um, the problems that exist in our communities today are a direct result from that period of time. So my intent as an author was be able, being able to have a book that could be used as a tool to start that conversation so change could happen. And so uh, that's fallen line Holden. My second book, and here I'm going to make it a little bit more engaging and asking you guys questions before we proceed, is titled Horizon. And Horizon is different from Fallen Line Holden in that it's a wordless book, so it's driven entirely by illustration. Um, some of the benefits and the reasons why I had written it wordless was to promote, again, literacy and provide space to develop a love for language and reading. And so uh, some of the value that you might see in a wordless book and why that was chosen, I put up on the screen uh, here. The first thing that I, I, I intended for the book was to build confident and independent readers. Oftentimes with a wordless book, you're able to have kids assign labels and words to pictures, uh, which would then help build vocabulary. Um, and then after that's mastered and the children have a grasp of what's happening, you can then transfer that to books with text. And the great thing about that is that a book with word, uh, no words 
Um, there's no one way to tell it. You know, it leaves it open for interpretation. So anyone who reads it isn't wrong in how they interpret and tell it. So um, in building that confident, independent reader, it's a good launch point into getting and developing the love for the books. It's also wordless and the value is provided in that it makes cultural connections. So readers are able to share their knowledge of their culture, their history, their geography perhaps, and family norms. And this is great because it allows teachers to meet students where they are rather than you forcing instruction on them. It provides a starting point for um, conversations to happen. Again, it allows people who might be hesitant uh, or might not have reading skills developed to participate. Because if you could draw on relations towards how this relates to my life and my culture, it expands opportunities for reading. It also helps build basic literacy, literacy skills, um, which involves listening, listening comprehension, speaking, storytelling, story retelling, and then things like inferring and predicting what's gonna happen, similar to what we had done in Fallen Line Holden. These techniques, again, help build those literary skills that build that independent, confident reader. And then the last value of wordless picture books that I really allude to is it helps students and young kids master story elements, getting into things, as I had mentioned with Fallen Line Holden, understanding characters, setting, plot, problems and solutions, even breaking down the components of a story from the beginning, middle and end, and then figuring out the story theme. It also allows young readers to make connections to self. This is how it relates to me, to other texts. Oh, I read this in another book and that's how it relates. And then the world from a larger standpoint, this is how it relates from that standpoint. So um, those are the values of a wordless book and why I had developed it in that manner uh, for really speaking to often the voiceless of the classroom, those who might be hesitant to engage with the story. This book provides opportunities or an outlet for them to engage and uh, be heard. In this book, I also use a technique which I got from a friend. Uh, I was working with an individual who works for John Hopkins who mentioned that oftentimes those who don't know how to use a wordless book, perhaps a teacher or a parent or somebody who's not familiar with the Navajo culture uh, would need to know before diving into it. So I provide a little um, pre teaching moment uh, at the beginning of the book that allows for pauses within the book for you to ask questions, uh, especially pertaining to characters, setting, and then transitions relating to the plot. Uh, this allows you to ask questions uh, of what's going on in the narrative, uh, perhaps what is the character thinking, how do they feel, maybe sharing an experience that you felt like that at a certain period of time, uh, information about setting, and then transitions, which would allow opportunities for you to predict what's going to happen next. So this is also an element of the book that I think contributes to everything I discussed. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into her. Actually, no, wait. Um, let me ask you guys some questions really quick. Since this is a wordless book, um, I got to ask you guys to put on your looking goggles and really use your eyes to interpret to the story. So first thing I'd like you guys to do is look at this cover. And if someone could explain to me what you see, what do you notice? Desert. Sorry, Danielle, go ahead. I said the desert. The desert, okay, so this is in the, the southwest. Somebody said there's Haystack, New Mexico over on the edge. Yeah, we see uh, a big old mesa. Uh, we see herding sheep, so we see some sheep down here. So perhaps it's dealing with something involving uh, sheep herders. Uh, we got the balloon. Hot. Sorry, go ahead, Melinda. The air balloon. Yeah, we see the hot air balloon over here, so that could be an ode to the region. I know that they have the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta, the Red Rock Park Balloon Fiesta in Gallup. Up in uh, Monument Valley, they have a balloon fiesta, so they're speaking to that, but also balloon is uh, hot air balloon is a mode of transportation. So perhaps this is a story of travel. And then the last thing that you might've noticed perhaps is the tidal horizon. So speaking to the area where the 
uh, sky meets the earth. Um, so something in the distance, perhaps, is what we're looking at. You might also notice that the um, horizon is spelled uh, differently than what we might be accustomed to. It's starting off H-E-R, so it's probably a story about a female character or a heroine in this case. And so, perfect. How you guys just interpret it, how you looked at the picture is exactly how we're going to be reading this book. And if you look at things like the bold red color, things like that will come into play as well. So keep that in your mind. So perfectly how you guys had just done it. So the very first thing that was mentioned, or one of the things that was mentioned was the hot air balloon. Again, that's owed to the area that we had come from. It's a mode of transportation. And so you'll see the little girl here flying out at the balloon fiesta in Albuquerque. You mentioned the sheep and being a sheep herder. I was raised growing up, um, spending every summer with my cousins herding sheep in the, um, in the land of Haystack. You know, that's what our role was. And so this is a story that's going to detail that type of lifestyle, getting up at 5 a.m., uh, getting shooed off with a bologna sandwich and a milk carton full of uh, water. Uh, that was my responsibility growing up because my grandmother, uh, Bessie, her, uh, she was a weaver. And if you know anything about uh, sheep and rearing sheep, it's a part of a lifestyle, you know, it's a form of sustenance, you know, for food but also income as well. So my grandmother used to sell her rugs and that's how we sustained our family. But if you know anything about weaving, it's an intergenerational um, activity that involves, you know, the grandkids going out and herding the sheep daily. It involves the nieces and aunties and grandmas every spring to shear the sheep, uh, spin it, dye it, cart it. The uncle's going up getting the wood to make the fire to make those natural dyes. And then my grandmother would make the rugs. So uh, perhaps this is a story about intergenerational uh, activity. And then the last thing was mentioned was the horizon. So if you notice the skyline, this is Haystack uh, near Mount Taylor, which I mentioned is where I'm from. Uh, so this is probably a story about something in the distance, something you could see into the, uh, the future, perhaps even speaking to it. So. Perfect. That's how we're going to read this book. So without further ado, Horizon, story by Daniel W. Vanderver and illustrated by Corey Begay. So right off the bat, we're looking at a setting. What do you notice? Who do you see? What do you think is important about this scene? Sheep. Okay, so we see somebody maybe looking for her sheep. Who is this? Somebody grandma. says, yes, okay. So somebody in the chat says, there's grandma. We might be able to tell us grandma from her cane. She has a nice Masana scarf on. She has something in her hand too. They somebody saying it's binoculars. I wonder what she's looking at. Uh, what else do you see? My swiper. Said again? Oh, we got the fly swatter up here. So maybe she's outside on the porch. We see some sleeping sheep dogs on the bottom. Looks like they're just kind of lounging around, guarding the house. We see somebody in the kitchen too. It looks like a girl. So that's what we're kind of interpreting and what we see here. So maybe it's an intergenerational house. Somebody says she's doing dishes in there. I wonder if that's what she's doing. But the main thing is we see out if that meat hanging or if it's clothing okay so we're our clothing up here something's up there but what we notice is it's probably an intergenerational home right and grandma's looking at something in the distance i wonder what she's looking at what do we see here looks like grandma's looking off into the distance and she's seeing a couple of lazy boys sleeping on the job and there you see some of the sheep wandering off I wonder what grandma's thinking here. Looking she's at these saying, yada, laugh, they're just sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> she's saying, yada, laugh, what's happening? These lazy boys, she's sleeping on the job. But that's what we see that grandma's looking at. Looks like grandma's using her cane now to get somebody's attention. It looks like it's the little girl. We could see a little bit closer now that she is doing dishes. Here she is doing dishes at the sink. 
So if you're washing your hands doing dishes, you're probably gonna have to dry them off, right? So here we see the little girl taking a little towel and grandma now gave her the binoculars. What do you think grandma's telling her here? Look, those go towards. over. <laughs> <laughs> Say, look, look what your naughty cousins are doing. They're just sleeping on the job. And the girl's putting her eyes to the binoculars. Look that wish. Yeah, huh? sleeping over there. I wonder what the girl's going to see. And it's not what grandma saw, right? What does she see? She sees mutty. She sees coyotes and wolves here. And what are they looking off into the distance? What do you think's on their mind? Sheep. They want to eat the sheep. Sheep, sheep and mutton. They're like the boy at Holden wanting to eat mutton stew. It got it on their mind and they're ready to eat. You see the girl looking off into the distance. And how do you think the girl feels about that? What do you think she's thinking here? You think she's happy or excited? She wants to go rescue them. Maybe she wants to rescue them. Somebody said that she looks a little alarmed. Maybe she's a little startled about it. Like, oh no, what if the coyotes get me? But what does grandma do to her right here? What happens? She gives her her handkerchief. Right, she gives her her scarf or her anchor, her handkerchief. She ties it up. I wonder what she's gonna have the little girl do. Send her out yeah. to, to help. Right, yeah, she might send her out to help. And so maybe this is a little thing to help in her journey. You see her tie up the little girl's scarf and what does the girl do? She unties it. Yeah. So she's leaving, she's leaving the porch. And what first thing she does, it looks like she's untying it and she throws it over her head. Wonder where she's going or what's gonna happen. Have you guys ever left home and felt free? Like you're, you're free from home and could do whatever you want. Looks like that's what's happening here. Somebody said, takes it off. Maybe she takes off herself, because look, if we turn the page, what is she doing here? It looks like she's flying, right? You see her little fingers over here on the edge. Somebody says it's using it like a sail. So she's flying high. If you've ever been in a plane, can you tell where we are? Are those the coyotes? Can you tell if that's where she's already at? What animal do you see? Horses. Yeah, we see some horses. It looks like a wild little stampede going on. And if you look, we have Monument Valley in the background. Maybe it's all wild and uh, Western like we see in the movies. And as you can see, she's sailing off. There she is with her scarf holding it high above in the sky. And she's looks like she's floating pretty grace, gracefully with these uh, insects or these um, butterflies that you might be seeing. And as she's coming down, we get a closer look. We see the horses. Do you think she's gonna ride one of those horses? Let's find out. And now what do you see that scarf turn into? It's no longer a hang glider. It looks like it's a saddle blanket, right? Do you think she's going slow as she's riding this horse? No, she's going fast. fast. Looks like she's really booking it, huh? Really riding it, going fast. Cause you could see from this little horse, she's distancing herself until so what happens? Oh my gosh, it looks like the horse puts on the brake. Somebody says, oh no. Do you think she's in danger? What do you think's yeah. gonna happen? I think she's gonna continue flying again. You think she's gonna continue flying? Maybe that scarf will turn back into a uh, hang glider or something that will save her. Let's find out. This is where I would say cannonball, because we have a big old splash coming up. And if you notice, her little scarf turned into almost like a little cape or something that protects her from the fall. But if we look at that past page, there's a nice little river in there. So it looks like she falls right into the river. And we see the little girl in this bottom picture. It looks like she's... Um, collecting herself a little. Do you think she's in danger anymore of getting in hurt or something? 
Or do you think she's nice and collected now? What does her scarf turn into? A tent. A tent, yeah. If you look, notice the water almost saved her. And so water is really important. You know how they say it's like a uh, water is life. Looks like it almost saved her and rejuvenated her in this sense. She's kind of squeegeeing out her scarf. She's smooth sailing, somebody said into the chat. So maybe she's free of that danger. But not long. Looks like we got a waterfall coming up. So looks like that danger is right around the corner. But what does she turn her uh, tent into now? Where's that scarf? It's a magic carpet. Yeah, exactly. There she is flying high and above. There she is escaping that danger. You guys know where this is? You ever been to Canyon de Shea? She's at Spider Rock. Rock. And does it look like she's in danger now or is she may be singing a whole new world? Looks like she's kind of rejuvenated, right? At Spider Rock, she's safe again. Here she is flying up against the canyons. Now we're seeing that the scarf is going to turn into something else. Looks like she's coming down now. Maybe she's getting closer to the sheep. What do you think that scarf is going to turn into next? If you guys ever played Fortnite or if you have kids who like Fortnite, it looks like it's turning into a glider or a parachute. So she's coming down now. It looks like she's going down to the ground because we see her coming down the mountain. And you notice she's not coming as wild as she was on that horse. It looks like she's taking a little bit of care coming down. So maybe she's learning a thing or two of how to use that um, scarf. And who do we notice here? It looks like she's almost there. Who do we see? Sheeps and the coyotes. Yeah, there goes the sheeps and the coyotes and those lazy boys. I hope she comes down in time. Hopefully she's gonna save the, uh, the sheep from the mutties. And what does that scarf turn into now? Slingshot. A slingshot. Looks like she got there right in the time, nick of time and saying, not today, coyotes. And so you can even see her shoot a little rock over their head, chasing them off. But we only see two different coyotes. There goes that she's sheep. yelling. She's saying, hi. <laughs> she's really putting it in her uh, throat. Huh? <laughs> There's the other coyote. But what does that scarf turn into now? A rope. Looks like she's a nice little cowgirl. It turns into a lasso. And just in the nick of time, it looks like she captures that sheep before the coyote swipes at her. And just for good measure, what does that scarf turn into? Looks a like whip. This little whip. Come on. What she's saying, that's what Hannah was saying. She's saying, go on. <laughs> and there goes that last coyote running off into the distance. And so how do you think the little girl feels here? You think she's still scared or a little intimidated? It looks like she's Wonder Woman, maybe even grandma. She has her hands on her hips. She's even telling off her little cousins right there. She's so yelling she at her cousins. <laughs> yeah, she's all boss status right there, telling people... They need to go back and do their job. She looks really resilient. And so we here we see the cover. We see her traveling home and there goes the boys taking the sheep back. And after her nice hard day of saving the day, she's kind of taking her time, making her way back. But how do you think the girl feels? I only have about four, three minutes left, so I'm gonna hurry up and kind of speed through this. How do you think she feels? Tired perhaps? She might feel a little sad. She's kind of hanging her head. Like, well, how would you feel if you had to give up your scarf, your magic scarf, your magic carpet, your weapons? Maybe she's going to have to go in and uh, do dishes again. Would you want to go back and do dishes after saving the day like that? No. Not at all. No way. No way, Jose. But what does grandma do here? Make it hair buds. Yeah, instead of giving her back the dish towel, she turns her around and makes a, a tie. 
She gives her a Navajo bun with that scarf, gifting it to her. And we're left with the little girl looking off into the distance. And can you tell? There goes her cousins finally getting the sheep back. I wonder what the little girl's looking at into the distance. And what do you see? Who do you see from the story? Or what do you notice in this picture as she's looking off into the distance? The coyote. Yeah, there goes the coyote. So maybe her job's not done yet. Maybe she's going to go back and take care of those coyotes so they don't come and attack the sheep anymore. What else do you notice? The land being um, taken over by buildings, casinos. Okay. Kind of yeah, exactly. So maybe she's going to be protecting against this kind of development where you see the land being taken over. You might have her take off on take on uh, casinos, you know, especially as a lot of families are losing their paychecks there every now and then. Somebody had mentioned that there's COVID right here. So maybe she's going to be a future doctor. Perhaps she could be uh, somebody who helps protect her community from that. You might see Window Rock into the distance. So somebody had said she might be the next Navajo Nation president, for example. So she might be the next Jonathan Nez. So some type of representation in there. Uh, you also see things like energy. So maybe she's going to combat that and protecting the earth. Uh, internet, maybe she's going to bring that into the, the world. Uh, she looks a little bit older, so she's probably developing uh, but what you see her really doing is tying her bun down, ready to go to work. And so that's how the book ends with her looking at the horizon, ready to make an impact onto the future. And so uh, that's the story horizon. Uh, at the end of the book, I did include a discussion guide, which includes questions um, that's approached from the Navajo Dene philosophy of education uh, standpoint. How do you first think about a story? then plan around it, then actually talking about it and then reflecting on it. Uh, this is a guide that you could use with your students to help further dive into the story. I include themes and imagery of each of the elements that you have seen. So if you didn't really understand what each represented, for instance, the dish towel representing traditional female rules, which many are breaking from. Uh, so we're not just stuck in the kitchen anymore. Uh, the representation of the sheep representing traditional Navajo life ways spider rock and its significance on Navajo culture. So at the end of the book, I did link that, including a QR code uh, to extend it. So if there's full um, learning that needs to happen, then um, people could do that. So I apologize if I went a little bit over, but uh, those are my two stories. I hope you were each able to see the significance and how they were developed and why they were designed as such, really to help with literacy. And so like I mentioned, I really appreciate you guys having me here today and speaking with you all. I think if any change happens within our communities, it starts with you. And so I'm in gratitude to everything you guys do within your communities. I think that's where the change happens and I appreciate it. So yeah, uh, I don't think there's any time for questions, but uh, you have my email address. If not, I'll put it into the chat and um, you know, invite me to your school sometime and hopefully we can do a reading or further this conversation in one way or another. So. Yeah. Thank you, oh, Daniel. Daniel that was so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. So if everybody would gonna give them a soft round of applause, we appreciate you being here, uh, Daniel. Yay. And we are so lucky to get two books written to us today. What a what a treat! And so, um, just a reminder: all the attendees here will be getting a access to a code where you will receive a free copy of his new book. And so we are just so happy that he was able to make time for us. Thanks again, Daniel. Um, you're welcome to join us later for the breakout sessions. So I'll hand it over now to Chris so she can get Ken rolling. Thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful uh, participation. Again, thank you, Daniel. That was so much fun. Great opportunity to be able to enter the world of uh, both of your stories. So thank you for making that so engaging and being so um, intentional about helping us to learn as educators how to use both of your materials. That was a great opportunity for all of us. Thank you everyone for your comments to Daniel and um, your reactionary button to thank him. We can see why you are an award-winning author and greatly appreciate all of your accomplishments and efforts in helping us with our, our activities today. And turning this over now to another wonderful opportunity. I'd like to introduce 
excuse me, Ken Duncan again. He's going to take us into the wonderful world of oral storytelling and with the tradition of an activity to be able to join with your students in the classroom as well. So, Daniel. Oh, you mean Ken? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Ken. That's okay. My name is uh, Ken Duncan Sr. And I'm an Apache from the San Carlos uh, Apache Reservation. And I became a storyteller because my brothers, my sister and I were raised by our paternal grandparents, my father's uh, mother and father. And so being very poor and not having much in the wintertime, my grandfather would stoke up the cast iron stove and he would tell us to sit around the stove and we would be on the floor and he would sit in a chair and he would start telling stories in Apache. And my brother, sister and I, we did not learn English until we were maybe beginning second grade at the Paradox Mission Lutheran School. And so my traditional stories, I translate from Apache into English. And I picked up some other stories too along the way. And so far I've taught my own children how to, how to be storytellers. So if I couldn't make it, my children usually take the stage or go in the classroom and they are able to tell my stories as well. So my wife and I, uh, we have seven boys and we have one daughter and now I'm a grandfather and um, at 63 years old I'm a junior elder and so I have taught my grandchildren how to tell stories as well so they can also share my stories if they had to do so. So I'm very proud to say that what came from my grandmother, grandfather I gave to my children and now my grandchildren are carrying on this tradition. And so to me, I'm a storyteller because I believe that's one of the main reasons um, that children would be learning how to listen to the elders, especially to the seniors. And as a grandfather, I now see what my grandfather was doing to us. And a very traditional Apache way of storytelling, there is a thing that is done that I don't think other storytellers do around the world. I have been with storytellers in over 50, 60 countries. And I was a consultant as a traditional artist and storyteller for the Arizona Commission on the Arts, teaching in the classrooms here, uh, working with other storytellers, and also with, the, uh, with the, uh, our State Department. Um, and I used to go to all of the uh, consulates and embassies around the world as a cultural artist. And then I also served as a cultural consultant, as a storyteller, sharing my stories through a translator for the uh, Department of Defense. And so doing all of those storytelling, I've never met someone that also does what the Apaches have done, which is when my grandfather would tell a story, he'd say, Early in the morning, under the beautiful stars, you were sitting under a tree, and there, as you listened to the water flowing, there suddenly, and then my grandfather would stop. Quickly, before he walked away to go to bed, we would have to say, ha, huh, really quickly. That was a sign that we were paying attention and listening. So we all told one another, my two brothers and my sister and I, that when grandfather stops, one of us quickly has to say, huh, so we won't go to bed early. So we wanted him to tell stories as much as possible so we can stay up as late as possible. And so I won't be doing that here, but I will be telling the stories all throughout the whole storyline. But that is the traditional way of Apache storytelling is you, the storyteller tells a story and then he stops abruptly, very quickly. And he looks at all the kids and quickly the children would have to respond, huh? And then he would continue on again. He would do this maybe four, five, six times throughout the whole story. This taught the children that they needed to listen to the story. They needed to pay attention to the elder who was telling the story. And so that is how I was raised. And so, once again, uh, my name is Ken Duncan Sr. I'm from the uh, San Carlos Apache Reservation. 
Those are my two clans. My clan is originally from the White Mountain Reservation and my uh, grand, my mother's, my father's clan is from um, the Aravaipa people. And so that's my cultural background. And so my stories came to me by, I guess the chief medicine man on my reservation in sand painting and uh, lightning rain medicine. I did not know growing up that the reason why all of these people and women elders were coming to our house a lot and singing and dancing as my grandfather sang was that he was teaching them how to do the ceremonies. It was my grandfather who was in charge of all of the prayers and ceremonies and I was taught by him. And uh, my grandmother, I did not know, was the clan chief of the 12 grandmothers that makes up our clan. And uh, she taught us a whole different way of storytelling. My grandmother said, come outside with, us, with me. Grandchildren, come follow me and we will go outside. And as we sat outside on her bench that she had sitting outside, we would look at the stars and she said, look at those seven stars up there. Where is it? Right there. Is he count them? And she would look at the seven sisters, also known as Pleiades. And so she says, a long time ago, the spider went up into the sky. And he, she started weaving all of these webs up in the sky. And she would just go and weave. And she would weave and weave and weave. And so she would make all these different designs. And so she would teach us how to do all of these things. And she would be weaving all the way through. And then she would make this design right here. She say, see, those are the stars up there. And then she saw that she needed to add more stars to it. And so she went and added some more. And so Spider was always busy up in the sky, making all of those designs. And so she would make all of those designs that she would make the seven stars right there. And so she told us, the stories in her own way using a simple string. And so I teach stories in two different ways. First with just the voice and the other with, with my string. And so those are the two traditional Apache ways of storytelling. And so if you have any questions about either one of these later on, uh, you can do that. So our stories are very unique. You have to stop abruptly until the listener acknowledges you by saying, ha, huh, and then also using a string. And so that is how I was raised. And uh, in my development as a storyteller, later on through the Arizona Commission on the Arts and the Arizona Historical Society Museum here in Tempe, I was asked to develop my stories into one hour plays. And so I would have the teachers decide Two, from two of my stories to choose from, I would teach about maybe eight or 10 classes throughout my one month residencies. And the last two weeks, we would use those to develop a play. And the children and their families would create their own uh, backdrops, their set designs. They would make their own instruments. I would have them make gourd rattles. I would have them make drums and I would have them make their own dance staffs and everything. And so all of this storytelling that was simply done with just the voice coming from an old man, my grandfather, now I develop into plays. And I use background music, native music, and I even have the children play. And one of the most interesting stories that I did on stage was with, with the Phoenix School for the Deaf. At first, the teachers didn't know how that could be done, but I was able to do that using vibration. And you can ask me later on how I did that, but um, it was very interesting. And the way they played the rattle was not by holding the handle, but they would hold the round part so they can feel the beads inside hitting against their palm. And so it's been very interesting. And uh, the reason why I still do storytelling is because Again, it is a way to get the children to be close to you, to spend time, quality time with the children, and they can actually hear your voice. 
Um, I do have the utmost respect for uh, people that write books. I, I enjoy the beautiful um, illustrations and everything. In fact, I'm writing a story uh, right now and I'm gonna write maybe three more children's stories, which is in progress. And the long-term pro project that I'm working on is an autobiography of how I was raised by my, by my grandparents and how I learned how to do uh, Apache sand painting, uh, how to do um, the different ceremonies as a little boy, which I don't do anymore. I'm not a medicine man or anything, but I was the shadow for my grandfather being the oldest of four children. Uh, being raised by him. And so <clears throat> those are the things that I, I was raised, raised with. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, tell you what I had prepared. And this is also what I do besides doing the plays. I have the children get construction paper, just black construction paper or brown, and to simulate a cliff. You know, we have all these cliff writings, petroglyph. You know, petro means rock and glyph means writing. Not hieroglyphics, but petroglyphs. And so in the Southwest here, a lot of our ancestors left behind very important uh, things. Things that they felt were important to put and chisel one little flake at a time on the rocks. So they found something like this. A uh, black or a brown slate of rock somewhere in nature along a cliff somewhere and then they would choose that place and they would go and chisel different images in there. I just put these words on the bottom for the teachers just to show what it means but I was going to translate but I thought it would be easier to write the meanings below and so uh, when you do this project you will not have the words, just the symbols. So make sure you do not have the students put any letters on the bottom. They need to translate it themselves. So I would have a student make, get a piece of paper and I would have them tear the edges around just a little bit at a time. And they would make their own piece of rock slate. And then once they have that on a, tablet on a tablet as a practice they would draw on there from my chart here of the meanings of the petroglyphs a lot of these are apache and they would go and use look at this and they would write on the paper and pencil a little drawing they would create on this piece of paper, which would look like this, but they would practice first on a blank sheet of paper. And after they showed me what it means, then I would allow them to go ahead and transfer that into their piece of rock. And then they would use uh, chalk, yellow or white chalk, or they could use a yellow or white pastel, the, the ones that look like crayons that oil those oil sticks. And so if you have oil sticks, that is better because then it won't flake off as chalk does. On this one here, after I used chalk, I had to use a fixative to put it to secure the chalk so it won't all just kind of chip off. So this has fixative on it to cover it, make sure it stays intact. So this is one of the things that I do. And when we are done with my presentation later on, I can make this available through the uh, organizers of this time period right now. I'll give this to them and you can go ahead and use this. And this can be something that you can refer to when you do your presentations. So again, you make the petroglyphs, get a blank, a book of um, black or brown construction paper and have the children take off little pieces at a time, have them tear little pieces because some of them start ripping and then they rip too many big pieces off. So have them just kind of like a little mouse nibbling away. Have them take that apart. Once they have that, then have them get a piece of a paper and have them use the chart that I have over here. Have them look at that and see if they can come up with a story, the positive story 
about their families, about what they feel about animals or their environment, about themselves, what makes them happy, what they appreciate and cherish. These are only happy thoughts. That's why I have to review their message first before they put it on the chart. Then once I approve that it's a, a positive message and then they can transfer it from their book, their tablet, onto the rock. And then once they finish this, then if you use chalk, then it's good to have a fixative spray and make sure that you spray it down and let it dry. And so this is it here. So this one here is warmth and love for family brings growth in the home. So you can see what I did here. So that's another way of storytelling that I do. So I would tell eight to 10 stories just through speaking to the children. And then later on, I would have them do this activity. And then I would have them share with the class their petroglyphs. And many of the teachers have made wall petroglyphs outside their classrooms so that other children can actually see what the children put on here. And so what I also have done is um, I only have them take the upper part right here so children can flip them over and there would be the meaning of the story on the back. So when people are going through and say, oh, look, I wonder what that means. They can flip it over and then the children will have written what their message means. So that's what I usually do. So these can be put on as a classroom, a wall of petroglyphs. So that way all of the class, the, the school will be learning, even if they're not in my classroom, they will walk along the hallways and they will look at it and they can see what the children find valuable. Uh, their environment, the water, rain, the land, all of those things. And so that's what I do as, as an Apache storyteller. And I have been very fortunate, as I mentioned, to travel to many, many parts of the world. I've, I'm very, very blessed. And uh, I don't know if I'll travel anymore. I think it's better to be safer for me to be home now. <laughs> but um, I do have a lot of stories. And um, as an Apache, we only tell stories in the wintertime. And many tribes, storytellers will tell you, we only tell stories in the wintertime. And they have their own reasons. Each tribe has their own reason. But if a student is to ask you, why do Native Americans, why do the Apaches tell stories only in the wintertime? Well, the reason why my people, the Apache, this is, this is strictly an Apache reason. The, the reason why we only tell stories when the first snow flies up in the highest mountain peak, when the bears start seeking refuge in the caves and ravines and the hidden places is because a long time ago, when the creator made all living things from the rivers, the mountains, the water, all of the birds, the animals, the fish, the reptiles, amphibians, even man, he gave them one rule and that was to look after one another, to take care of each other. But as time went by, the bear people saw that they were bigger and they were stronger than most other animals, most other creatures. So they started using their bigness and their ferocity rah, to be more selfish. When they saw somebody kill a deer over there, maybe a mountain lion, they went and took that away from them and they ate it themselves. Or if they had more berries they gathered, even the birds, if they were hungry, just to decide asking for berries, the bears did not share. And so the creator above, he saw what was happening down below. And so he spoke to all the bears and he told them, because you bears are not taking care of people that are in need and you steal from other smaller animals. You bears are selfish. I will punish you now. And so he got after the bear people. And he said, bear people, you will no longer be able to walk on your hind legs anymore as you did. 
That's why bears try to get up and walk on their back legs, but they're forced back down on their fours. They were punished and lost the ability to walk as human beings. Number two, the creator said, no longer will you be able to start fires and cook your own meals. That's why bears are drawn to the smell of food out in nature when people are cooking food in their camps. And then number three, you no longer will you enjoy spring, summer, fall, and winter. I'm going to take one of these seasons from you. In the winter time, I will take that away from you, and you will be fast asleep in the winter time. And so that was the third punishment. And then the Creator said, and the fourth punishment will be the most painful. And the bear people said, no, no, please don't, don't punish us anymore, Creator. We're sorry, we're sorry. But the uh, Creator says, no, you bear people need to be taught a lesson. The fourth punishment is that only when you bear people are fast asleep in the caves way up in the mountains, in the canyons down below somewhere, only when you are snoring and fast asleep, only on that, the fourth punishment is that only then will storytelling be told because you will not be allowed to enjoy storytelling anymore only in the winter time when you cannot hear these beautiful stories you selfish bears who did not care for animals all around you that needed your help only then will these traditional stories be told and so that's why apaches tell stories only in the winter time only when the bear people cannot hear us and so there's a lot of traditional ways that we tell our stories. And so I'd like to share with you a story at this time. And uh, this story is about, um, this story is about how the Salt River here in the Phoenix area, we have a river that flows from the high mountains. And this mountain, Mount Baldy, is our prayer, is our prayer mountain. That's where we offer prayers to the Creator from the foothills of this great mountain in the land of the Apache starts this river and it flows all the way down into the ocean. And so the story goes that there was a little girl, there was a little girl who was in line early one morning under the beautiful stars, yellow, green, orange, blue, purple, beautiful singing lights high above. Said grandmother. Listen to how beautiful they're singing with the changing of their lights, grandmother said. They were all lined up outside early in the morning with their blankets drawn over them and with their baskets, the Apache burden basket, on their backs, all of them. Even the little girls had these smaller versions of the baskets dancing on their backs. They were empty. By noontime, it was to be filled with fruits from the prickly pear cactus, later to be made into candy, into jam, into syrup, into juice. And so all of the grandmothers were in the front. The clan chief grandmother, the very first one, was in the front. All the grandmothers lined up in single file. And then all the daughters, the oldest ones to the little one, and the mothers were in the back, very back to be the guard, to make sure everything was okay. And they started walking down, down the forest, through the pine trees they walked, all the way down until the trees turned into cedar, juniper, and they kept walking more and more. Later on, it became chaparral, and pretty soon you saw an acotillo, a yucca, you saw a cactus, the barrel cactus, and then all of a sudden, they saw the beautiful Saguaro with his arms. Grandmother, the chief, said, here we are. The sun had come up. Stars were long gone. The grandmother, the clan chief, says, all of the grandmothers, 
follow me and we'll take the gentler slopes over here and we will fill our baskets with all the fruit from the prickly pear cactus. But all of the grand, the mothers and your daughters, you stronger women, you take the ones that are steeper, go up on the ridges and take the fruit from the prickly pear over there. And so the grandmothers went this way, the mothers and the daughters went this way. All of a sudden, where they had gathered by that river that was heard flowing way down below, where they stood at the edge of a cliff, there was a little bush there. That bush all of a sudden started moving. It shook a little bit. It shook again, but there was no, no breeze. The grandmothers had already gone this way and the mothers and the daughters had gone this way. But that tree where they had gathered by the cliff next to the river, it was moving. All of a sudden, from within that bush came out a little dark head. The little dark head looked around. It was a little girl, a little Apache girl, about nine years old. She goes, yes, yes. No more grandmas. All the mamas and big bossy sisters are gone. Yay, I'm gonna put into my basket anything that I wanna put in here. I'm not gonna put any prickly pear fruit in here. I'm gonna put in here the prettiest flowers, the shiniest stones. Maybe, maybe that butterfly over there. And she tried to catch that butterfly, but the butterfly, it flew away. Morning, as the sun was coming up higher and higher to noontime, the little girl was all alone. All this time, all this time, the little girl, all that time she thought, the little girl thought that she had all the time in the world and she was running around, but she got tired. All of a sudden she was about to sit down and then she saw the most beautiful butterfly. I have to have that butterfly. Come here, butterfly. She almost caught it several times, but the butterfly kept dodging her and dodging her. She jumped and she ran and she tried again and again. Butterfly kept flying and she chased that butterfly way into a narrow canyon. She chased that butterfly deeper and deeper into that narrow canyon. She looked up and she could barely see the sky above. The cliffs were so high up there. The canyon was so narrow. Ah, ah, she goes, ah, I can't run anymore. I'm going to rest a little bit. You funny butterfly, go away then. I, I don't want you then, she said. Butterfly had flown away a long time ago. The little girl with her basket full of pretty flowers and shiny stones she had gathered all morning was resting against her. And the little girl was so exhausted. She sat in a soft, cold sand. And there against one of the cliff walls, she fell asleep. And she slept and she slept and she slept until all of a sudden she started shaking. Her teeth started chattering and she opened her eyes and it was dark. She looked above and there was no more blue sky. Instead, there were stars sparkling way above. Oh no, the soul sense came out again. The singing lights are out. Shema, Shema, Shema. Her voice anchored, anchored in this canyon. Shewea, wea, wea. She called grandmother, she called mother, but no one answered. She started crying. She says, what am I gonna do? Please, creator, help me. I'm sorry I was naughty. I'm sorry I hid from my grandma and my, my mom and my sisters. Please help me, please, creator, please help me. I don't want to be lost. She goes, she was sitting in that dark canyon all alone, way high above the canyon cliffs. She could barely see the stars. As she was sitting there crying, not knowing to go this way or that way. All of a sudden, a breeze came into the canyon. I hear, I hear the rushing waters. When I was hiding in that bush next to the cliff, I could hear the mighty river down below in that canyon. This is where I came from. So she 
slowly picked up her basket and she walked this way following the sound and the sound led her back out of the canyon and there she saw the bush where she had hidden but no one is around shima shima she goes no one answered she wuya 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 grandmother didn't answer she didn't know what to do but everywhere it was dark no more singing birds but crickets and things that ran through the bushes all around her she was scared holding her little basket full of the shiny things she had gathered oh, what am i going to do she goes and then she saw the cliff and she heard the rushing water down below so she slowly carefully felt her way to the edge and she dangled her knee-high moccasins over the edge and she put her basket next to her and she looked up and waited for the sun to rise to the east she looked at all the stars and remembered the stories that her grandfather taught her about how the stars came to be oh there's the north star she goes in apache we call it nakose the spinner all the stars spin around that one there she goes she was crying she tried to keep herself busy by remembering the stories of each of the groups of stars and constellations high above but she's crying tears kept rolling down her cheeks all the way all the way down over the edge and she kept crying and crying and crying and so the little girl her tears rolling down she sat there all night until finally the sun rose from the east the grandmothers and mothers had been searching everywhere for that little girl even the men from the village came down and they were looking everywhere but the last place they failed to look was the first place where they missed her finally the grandmother said let's go back to where we last saw her and there they saw her sitting on the cliff's edge everyone ran up to her her mother grabbed her and hugged her closely and scolded her then grandmother came and hugged her everyone hugged her and they started back for the village the men in the front the women in the back and, and they started going back up to the village high up in the mountains where the apaches live in the forest grandmother stayed behind and she said creator because we none here dikon na len na se hi bin nan ige a here because we none here she said creator thank you thank you so much for watching over this little one all night thank you thank you and just as she turned around in the apache way after a prayer and she took the first step to join the rest of the group heading up back to the mountains the creator spoke to her and said grandmother carefully come over to the edge of the cliff where you saw your granddaughter sitting so grandmother slowly looked over and the creator says you see down below you see that white piece of ground grandmother says yes i do that was not there before your granddaughter sat here on the edge of this cliff all night as she cried the tears came rolling down her cheeks and fell all the way down on the river's edge and there on the edge of the water the salt from the tears of your granddaughter formed that little salt embankment that salt embankment will always be there from now on the one sweet tasting water from the melting snows from mount baldy the sacred mountain when it comes flowing down into this canyon and it swirls against that now salt embankment it will make the water slightly salty and the people down lower in the desert areas on its way to the great water the ocean people will say hmm this water it tastes a little bit salty now let's rename this river the salt river that is how the river that once flowed through the phoenix area from the mountains of the apache people the white mountains received its name the salt river So that's one of the stories that I share with people to show children that there are some things that they do that might not be right that that might never go away some mistakes that you make are permanent 
So I always tell children, be very careful of what you do because you, you don't want to be like that little girl being mischievous and naughty. And all of a sudden you make a sweet, nice tasting river turn slightly salty. And those things have never changed. That river still has a slight salty taste because of what that little girl did. And so all, all of my stories, I try to relay the message of why those stories are, are taught. Like there's a story about bullying that I, that I share. It's the mosquito and the mountain lion. And I'll just briefly do this one. I don't want to run out of time yet, but so in the forest, there was a little tiny squirrel that lived in a log. And every weekend, the, ch the other children, the other little bear, the little bear cub, the, the bobcat, the kangaroo rat, all of those, the little turtle, the little quail, the turkey, they would all come play with that little squirrel. But one day, the mountain lion came roaming through and he started picking on the little animals, throwing them around, the little birds, even the turtle was thrown around. And this mountain lion, he didn't care to eat them as most mountain lions do to hunt, but he just wanted to have fun and bully those little animals and birds. And so he was doing that one time. And so as he was doing that, a little mosquito came and he saw what was going on. And he said to the mountain lion, quit bullying, quit picking on those little children. They're not bothering you. You're supposed to hunt for food, not to be playing with, with these things and just disrespecting them. Bullying is wrong. Stop that, stop that now. The mountain lion goes, rawr, rawr. who said that? Who said that? Rawr. And then he goes, I did. Who? I can't see you. He said, me, I'm the mosquito. And then he goes, bzz, 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 bzz. and he landed on the mountain lion's nose. Oh, you're small. Why are you trying to challenge me? He said, if you don't stop, I'm going to make sure you stop. I'm going to make sure that you no longer bully anyone. And so mountain lion goes, Ow, no one can do, do that to me. I'm the mighty mountain lion. Everyone's scared of me. Ow. The mosquito goes, I told you, quit bothering these little animals or you're going to be sorry. Bullying is not right. Mountain lion didn't listen. He started trying to grab one of those little animals again. I warned you, said the mosquito. Buzz! He took off and he went right into the mosquito's ear. I mean, the mountain lion's ear. And he went buzzing around and ow! Oh! he goes, buzz, 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 buzz. he was going crazy. That little mosquito was buzzing all over in his head. He ran around and he bumped himself on a tree and he almost got knocked out. He got up, rolled around again, rolled all over and he fell into the stream. He got all wet. Bzz, bzz, bzz. The mosquito kept flying around in his, in his head and he stung him here. He stung him there. And finally the mountain lion goes, stop, stop, stop. I promise. I promise I won't bother any more little animals or birds for fun. Please, I'll only hunt if I need to. You promise, said the mosquito inside his head. Yes, please, I promise. On the honor of a mountain lion, I promise, he goes. He came out. He says, okay, land on his nose again. You promise now, but just to be sure, I'm going to tell all my relatives everywhere. Whenever you hear a mosquito buzzing around, around you somewhere, anywhere, in the forest, in the desert, by the lakes, the streams, anywhere, that means my relatives are watching you to make sure you no longer bully anyone. Do you hear me? I promise, I promise, he said. Now go, he said. The mountain lion ran off, never to bully people anymore. From that time on, they only hunt for food. And that's one of the stories that I share. And there's another story about I tell about the deer and the antelope. This one is about, about bragging. And this is to make sure that children don't brag. <clears throat> because it's not a good um, positive thing to do. And so um, the deer was a very fast runner, but he always watched out for himself because of hunters. So he hid down in this canyon. But the antelope, he was very, very, very much into bragging. He would challenge anyone. And Apache, our name for the antelope is Jada, 
the swift one, the fast one. And so after he challenged everyone, he asked the, the coyote if he could race him. Coyote says no. He asked him twice, third time. After the fourth time, Coyote got so upset. He says, you know what? You're not the fastest. The deer is the fastest. I don't know why you're bragging. He can beat you just like that. The antelope was so upset that someone might be faster than him. So long story short, he challenged that deer to a race. The deer says, you're endangering my life because a hunter might see me racing you, but I will do it only so you won't be bragging to everyone here, bothering people, challenging them, just to show everyone that you are the fastest. That's not a good thing to do, to be bragging. But I will race you, so you stop bragging, okay? Okay, said the antelope. I'm gonna beat you anyway, said the antelope. I am Jade, I'm the swift one. So that morning they ran. And then at the end of the, 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 end of the race, antelope was beaten. The reason why was because even though the antelope was very fast, the deer was very smart. He said, since you challenge me, he said, since you challenge me, I get to choose the course. Okay, said the antelope. So the deer says, we will start on the plains on top of the mesa. We will start half a third of the race there. And I'll have the coyotes choose the course, but they will choose a course. One third of it will be on the low, on the flat area, but the middle part has to be in the canyon where I live. Up, down, and then up the cliff. And then the finish line will be on the other mesa. And so, because deer chose the course, he knew he could beat antelope. You see, antelope, was fast only on the flat areas. So while he was beating the deer on the flat part of the first part of the mesa, when they ran down into the canyon, the antelope had to be very careful not to break his legs. But the deer gracefully bounced and he bounced over the logs and the juniper bushes, over the cactus, and he bounded all the way up to the top. He had strong legs because he always lived in the canyons. And so when he got to the top, he looked back down and the antelope was still making his way down the canyon, haven't even started making his way up yet. So he took his time and he trotted across the finish line. At the end there, antelope finally came up and all the animals and birds and reptiles were there. And so the deer says, now that I beat you, you have to pay up. What do I have to pay, said the antelope. I want to have a beautiful full face, said the deer. I have a little bit of a shallow spot right here, he said. I want you to take all the fat from around your eyes. I want you to give that fat to me so I can make my face more fuller. I want to be more handsome, he said. So the antelope, he lifted his skin and he took all the fat from underneath around his eyes. He gave it to the deer and the deer stuffed it in here and he massaged until his face got really nice and round. And he did the same thing. The antelope took all the fat from around his eyes, gave it to the deer, and the deer did the same thing. Hmm, do I look good? So he said to his wife, you look very handsome, deer, said Mrs. Deer. And the man looked around. Thank you, he says, yeah, you look more handsome, said the other animals. Meanwhile, antelope was standing there, now with very shallow eyes. That's why antelopes have very shallow spots around their eyes. It looks like their eyes are kind of sticking out. Antelope turned out to look that way because one time he was bragging too much to the wrong person. And that person, the deer, taught him a lesson. And so that's about bragging. And there's another story too about how a hurt bird came to ask for help in a forest. Winter was coming. And he would fly south, but he hurt his wing. And so he couldn't fly south, and he had to do whatever he could to survive the winter. And so he asked the big trees with the big round leaves to help him. The cottonwood, the oak tree, the sycamore. All of them said they were too important and strong to be bothered by a little tiny bird. So he told, they all told the bird to go away. 
It was almost nighttime when the little bird didn't know what to do. He couldn't fly. Animals are going to come out at night and hunt me. They're going to eat me. He said, I won't see my wife and my children again. I told him I was going to be safe in the wintertime with the help of these trees, but they don't, they don't want to help me. He was sad. All the big trees with the big round leaves that were going to shield him from the falling snow and the north wind refused to help him. And so he was about to cry. But all of a sudden behind him, he heard a sound. He looked around and there he behind him was Grandfather Pine Tree, the one with no big brown ride right leaves, but skinny needles. Grand grandson, he said, I was watching those other trees. They were mean to you. Why did they refuse you so much? And so in the end, the pine people let the bird build his nest up in their branches. And they helped him by covering their branches all over him. And so the pine people helped save that little wounded bird until springtime came and he was able to meet his family again. But as punishment for the broadleaf trees in refusing to help that little bird, the creator punished them by making them lose their leaves every fall. Then when winter came, they would be standing barren as skeletons against the snow that covers their feet. But as a reward for their kindness and generosity, the pine trees are evergreen, even in the middle of snow, when snow blankets their feet. That's one of the stories that I share also with children, why they should be kind and caring with one another. And so those are the type of storytellers telling that I share with, with children. I even do um, a lot of adults and one of the most popular groups that have requested my storytelling are senior centers. They love my storytelling. And I incorporate my traditional singing and my traditional flute playing in my stories as it is called for when the coyote sings or when the rabbits do the dance, uh, when the, all of the uh, prairie dogs dance with their shakers. Those are what I also have the children make as part of my storytelling for my more extended uh, residencies. I have them create the, the instruments and then I have them play it in my storyline. And so those are the reasons why I tell my stories to teach children that there are certain things they should not do. And as you might've noticed, there are no humans in my stories. They're all played by animals, birds, reptiles. And that's how it's been along for the longest time in native storytelling. So I'd like to say thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions, I'll answer some questions. I think I have a few more minutes left. And I must ask, the music that that's playing in the background, is that your your creation? Oh, that is my that is my son's story, um, flute playing. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Your stories had me so entranced that I wanted you to go on and go on and go on. That was wonderful. Oh. Your great demonstration of how to create the petroglyphs and the understandings of what those are and how to create those. And even the detailed description of how to present the student work so that everybody can understand their positive messages. That was fabulous. Um, wonderful details for your descriptions and the storytelling and the great lessons that we learned from all of you. Thank you everybody for joining us. We hope to be able to offer something like this again in the fall. So I hope that you are able to join us again then. And I hope everyone learned um, different ideas to be able to incorporate native cultural aspects into your classroom. Thank you all for spending the afternoon with us. And if you've got any questions, please let us know. Otherwise, we will see you in the fall.